Good afternoon. My final presentation is going to be on Spies in the American Revolution. The patriotic victory in the War for Independence was not due to their ability to overpower the British. It was, however, due to their ability to outmaneuver the British. One of the critical aspects of this ability was the intelligence that was gathered by spy networks. These spy networks were a critical aspect of the victory for the War of Independence and for the military strategy formed by General George Washington. Uh, in this presentation, the American spy networks will be focused on some of the more prominent ones in the cities of Boston, New York, and Philadelphia, with uh, quick mentions of some of the British spies towards the end. And the first group that we'll be looking at, or the first spy network, um, is that of the Sons of Liberty. So the Sons of Liberty could be found in every single colony, but they're most notable for their activity in the city of Boston. Um, and in the city of Boston, the network for the Sons of Liberty was very extensive. Um, General George Gage was commanded to take the city of Boston and hold it, and this allowed the Sons of Liberty to be um, very close to their subjects as they were spying on them. Um, one of the most notable things that the Sons of Liberty were able to do in, through their network was um, discover a plot by General Gage to um, arrest John Hancock and Samuel Adams and also seize weapons stored at Concord. Um, through their network, they were able to alert the militia in nearby towns and villages and thereby uh, meet the British Army at the town of Concord. Um, they were also able to tell Samuel Adams and John Hancock, um, and allow this allowed them to escape the British um, evade capture. Uh, the next thing that they were able to do to cause mischief for the British uh, was intercept letters to General Gage and from General Gage, um, with which they they took information that they needed or wanted. And then they forged the letters and sent them back to General Gage or whoever he was sending letters to. Um, this helped them get a lot of very valuable information as to what the, the British were doing within the city and what their plans would be. Um, the next group is known as Knowlton's Rangers. Knowlton's Rangers is not exactly a network, but it was a group formed by General George Washington. Um, it, has, it was his very first attempt to create a spy unit instead of a spy network. Um, it was a special operations unit that could fight and gather intelligence. And that's the difference with, uh, between Knowlton's Rangers and some of the other spy networks that we'll talk about. Um, uh, General George Washington appointed Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Knowlton as the commanding officer of the unit. And that's why the volunteers of the unit were known as Knowlton's Rangers. One of the most notable of the volunteers is Captain Nathan Hale. He is probably one of the best known spies in the American Revolution. He volunteered to be a school teacher on the city of Long Island in order to spy on the British. And most people know him for uh, supposedly saying the words that he wished that he had more than one life to give for his country. Um, the next spy network um, was the first that General Washington tried to put together. Um, it was put together under Nathaniel Sackett, who was a New York merchant and a supplier to the Continental Army. Um, it was in the early spring and or in the spring and early summer of 1777 that Nathaniel Sackett was given $50 a month by General George Washington to put this network together. Um, initially, it was very successful. They were able to find out um, lots of crucial information for General Washington within the city. Ultimately, it failed, though, because the focus of the war went from New York to Philadelphia. Um, but while the spy ring was in activity, um, it was extremely important. Um, Sackett had at least three sub-agents underneath him, um, with the likelihood of many, many, many other people that had just never been identified. Um, the three, though, one of the most important, his name was Hercules Mulligan. He was a native of Ireland that came to immigrated to um, the colonies with his parents. He was able to discover at least two separate plots by the British to kidnap General Washington and was able to um, tell him of the plots in time for him to, uh, to make the threat null and void. Um, 
One of the sources that I relied heavily upon that was a great source for this particular network was G.J. Um, O'Toole, his book, Honorable Treachery. Um, it was a really great source for, for um, spy networks in general, from the, uh, the American Revolution all the way to the CIA. Um, so that brings us to uh, the Mercero unit, or the Mercero spy ring. Um, this spy ring is very important, also because uh, it was named after John Mercero, who was also one of the sub-agents under Nathaniel Sackett. Um, his spy ring is a completely different spy ring, though. Um, it was started by John Mercero um, when he volunteered to be an intelligence officer uh, to the forces located in New Jersey um, under Brigadier General Hugh Mercer. Uh, John Mercero was able to do this because he had family on Staten Island um, whom he could visit without drawing much attention to himself and thereby spy directly on the British. Um, he was able to give General Washington very important information regarding British movements and fortifications. Um, this particular spy ring continued until 1780. And one of the sources that I used for this was John A. Nagy, um, his book, George Washington's Secret Spy War. Um, John Nagy, in general, is a fantastic source for spy networks. He has recently, in the last few decades, discovered um, many, many new identities of spies in the American Revolution. Um, so he's, I think, a leading authority on the subject. Um, this would bring us to the last American spy ring that we'll be focused on, and that is the Culper spy ring. So the Culper spy ring was established in the summer of 1778, uh, General George Washington ordered Benjamin Talmadge to create the spy network um, that would eventually become known as the Culper Spy Ring due to the names taken up by some of the agents. Um, this network was known as the most professional of all the espionage operations on record in the American Revolution. Um, the network was able to spy on the British directly and gather intelligence on, um, on troop movements, fortifications, and military plans in New York. Um, Talmadge was also instrumental in developing um, the Culver Code Book, which, was, which included numbers representing names, places, and words to communicate information that was vital um, to General George Washington. Um, this code was also vital to the secrecy of the agents and the information that they were passing on. Um, it's one of the uh, most important aspects of the Culper Spy Ring, and it's, it's why they're considered one of the most professional. Um, another really interesting fact about this spy ring is that one of the agents, um, who is known as Culper Jr., his identity could never be discovered up until the 1920s, when Morton Pennypacker was able to look at um, letters from the Townsend family um, and compare them to Culper Jr. letters, and he was able to discover that the writing was the same, and he was able to identify Robert Townsend as Culper Jr. So that happened in the 1920s, and Morton Pennypacker is also um, a fantastic source for information on this particular spy ring. Um, real quick, uh, we'll look at the spy ring in Philadelphia. Only because the spy rings in Boston and New York had so much more details and um, so many more of the agents were able to be discovered later on. The spy network in Philadelphia was extensive and heavily relied upon by George Washington, but none of the identities of the agents could ever be discovered. So while they played a, uh, a foundational role in, um, in his military strategy at the time, no one truly knows exactly who it was that was able to help him discover the information that he needed. Uh, so this brings us to the British spies. And the first one that we'll look at is Dr. Benjamin Church. Um, Dr. Benjamin Church was located in the city of Boston, and he was actually considered a part of the Sons of Liberty, or at least um, uh, with them. Uh, if not a part of them, he was uh, a friend of theirs. He became a traitor. He was a double agent for General Gage. Uh, he was able to spy on the Sons of Liberty for him, and he was actually the man that betrayed Paul Revere and his wife, Rachel. Uh, Rachel Revere wrote a letter to her husband with very critical information, and she gave it to, um, to Dr. Benjamin Church, believing that he would give it to her husband, when in fact he gave it to General Gage. 
Um, when it was discovered that he was a double agent, um, it was told to George Washington, who was shocked, could not believe that Dr. Benjamin Church could be a double agent, but he was sentenced to a court-martial where he was found guilty and thereby imprisoned. Um, this was a, a huge shock to the rest of the community as well. But, um, so the next one would be General Gage's use of the Secret Service in Boston. The Secret Service was a British spy network that was paid by the British government or parliament. Um, General Gage used this to infiltrate the Sons of Liberty. He was able to use them as double agents so he could identify the identities of some, uh, some of the Sons of Liberty, um, their tactics, their plans, where they met, um, all that very vital information to the secrecy of their network. Um, the next is Gilbert Barclay. The, the story of Gilbert Barclay is actually kind of funny. Um, he considered himself a spy for, for Parliament um, out of the colony of New York. And uh, he wrote to Parliament after the war had ended and uh, was asking for a pension from the government due to his, his spying during the, Amer the American Revolution. But Parliament never acknowledged his efforts. Um, so whether he was or not, I, I thought he was a, a funny story to, to involve. Um, he considered himself a spy and the information that he was able to give Parliament important while Parliament itself did not. Um, the two last are Jean-André and uh, Benedict Arnold. Now everyone knows, or everyone who grew up in American school uh, knows who Benedict Arnold is or was and what he did. What a lot of us might not know is that Jean André was actually extremely influential to bringing Benedict Arnold to the side of the British. He led the negotiations that eventually made uh, Benedict Arnold capitulate to the British. Um, he was known as the most notorious British spy in the American Revolution, but he was eventually caught by the Patriots, um, sentenced to, or, or, or was given a... Uh, a trial and was eventually hung as a British spy, which effectually ended his espionage career. Um, one of the most important things to remember about this subject, at least, um, is that there are so many men and women that we don't know about, don't truly know about, um, don't know the, the identities or the extent of, of the actions that they were able to commit for their country or the country that they hoped would come from, the war for independence. Um, it's, it's amazing to think about what they were willing to sacrifice in order to help make the country of the United States an eventual reality. Um, and as aspiring historians, aspiring teachers, and aspiring professors, it's always important to realize and remember that we have to be extremely honest and, and try to be as unbiased as possible in our examination and our analysis of the past and what we ourselves would teach. Um, to future students or future um, audience members. So, in conclusion, the, the spy networks in the American colonies were extremely important for gathering information for General Washington and um, were a critical aspect of how he was actually able to win the war. Um, thank you for your attention.